send it through the table saw or the planer, clean it up, ready to go. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's how I started out. And then, so it's a natural migration to go from doing that to going into tool making. So I was doing the woodworking for antiquing and stuff like that, tool making. And then everybody says, oh, you should go back to school. So I went back to school. When I got out of school, then I had to make a choice because I couldn't, you can't be, I was a machine tool designer. You can't be a machine tool designer and fiddle around with woodworking, especially after cutting off this finger, that finger, and chewing that one up. Those three, they glued this, they sewed these two back on. This one here just got scratches. So table saws <laughs> bite. Yeah. yeah. So that was more hazardous to your health than... Uh... Plus they were starting to t find out about mahogany lung. There's a, there's a lot of problems oh, really? with woodwork. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Sure, makes sense. Mahogany lung is the worst. It's like asbestosis. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but walnut, anything where you're, you're getting a lot of sanding and stuff like that, because in the olden days, nobody wore a mask. I mean, right. that would, you'd you might as well have a sissy, have, you know, wore a mask. sissy right on their forehead. Yeah. Yeah. So. Plus, okay. I don't even imagine it. So. You know, uh, talking about all that wood, I've been to uh, the Bentley factory. I know Rolls Royce is the same. They, they keep stocks yeah. of wood. Huge. So they'll, they'll make a batch of cars and they'll save half the wood for forever. So if there's any repair or anything like that, they yeah. will match the grain. Huh. Amazing. Really? Yeah. Yep. They can match the grain and the age. The big thing is the age. Matching the age is extremely important. And they have wood stocks because we, we did a lot of work with Bentley and Rolls Royce when they were in crew mm -hmm. and then separately as well. Mm -hmm. And, and i tell you what, in crew, there are big giant warehouses full of ancient wood. Wood, yeah. And it's, it's really worth it. warping and everything else. Oh, it doesn't warp. <laughs> these are why big, you use... thick slabs. No, these are big, thick slabs. Oh, wow. And, uh, and they don't warp. Uh, uh, black walnut, there's, most woods warp, but black walnut, no, not at all. Anyway, enough talk of wood. <laughs> Today in modern woodworking. <laughs> so, uh, yes. time for the, the boilerplate, eh? Okay, want to thank everybody who's already joined us live. We're going to have a great show today. This is going to be a good one. We're going to be talking all about Sandy Monroe's teardown of the Chevrolet Bolt. We'll be talking about the Tesla Model 3, and who knows where the conversation's going to go. We're going to talk about uh, vomit. What's that? We have to talk about vomit. <laughs> we can talk about vomit on this show. Excellent. Finally, we get to talk about vomit. <laughs> I, so, right. as you watch the show, and if you got any questions, send us an email, send it to viewermail at autoline.tv. We'll also take any phone calls, and that number is up on the screen, 1-620-288-6546. And, uh, but keep the phone call short. Some people tend to go on and on. If you keep it short, get right to your question. We're more likely to put it on the show. And we're going to get going here in just a moment. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. AutoLine After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion, Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems, and by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. Well, thanks everybody for joining us on After Hours, and including you. I, I seem to remember your name. I'm pretty sure you're Gary Vasilash. Indeed. I haven't seen you in weeks now. It's, it's been a while. So, so I, was, I was thinking about more than a year ago, we were in Imperial Beach, California. We did a show about the Elantra. Yeah, for those at that. home, it's show 317, in case you want to look it up. And, and it was interesting. Yesterday, I was driving the uh, Elantra GT out in San Diego. And it's really amazing. So we did the original Elantra. Then they came out with the Elantra Echo. Then they came out last year with the Elantra Sport. Now the Elantra GT. It just keeps rolling on and on and on. But that show we did was, was an interesting show. Okay. So I recommend people look at that. Good deal. We got to let everybody know David Welch from Bloomberg is, for is in the house with us again. Good it's to be back. Great to have you here, man. It's been a while that, that you've been on the show. I guess so. Yeah. A few months at least. Yeah. 
something like that. Wow. But good having you back. And our special guest of the day, Sandy Monroe of Monroe and Associates, mm. who is, I don't know, you've been on the show a number of times. This has got to yep, be yeah. like number but it's four. Been a big, it's been a big gap. It, I, I couldn't was, find the place. It was place the BMW i3 the last time you were on the show. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, so there, there you go. There's a whole Bring Back Sandy fan page. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, all my Hashtag friends. Hashtag <laughs> Bring Back Sandy. Yeah. Well, let's talk about your latest effort because you did a teardown on the Chevrolet Bolt, the, yes. the Bolt EV, and uh, UBS, the the big banking investment yeah. firm, contracted you to do this. And man, this thing has created a storm. <laughs> <laughs> I yes, that is exactly true. So yesterday I was in London, England, um, uh, uh, and we made a, yet another presentation with the uh, folks at UBS on um, on the on the bolt and under normal circumstances because that was a bespoke job that was a custom job strictly for ubs no one was supposed to know about it i have no idea how somebody got a hold of that report and uh, and tossed it into the internet but they have never seen anything like it um, and normally i would never talk about it but it seems everybody's got the damn report so <laughs> i don't know what to i don't know what to say hey it's in the public domain <clears throat> now we can talk oh, about yeah, it yeah, i'm sure that ubs is not too unhappy because <laughs> it depends on who you talk to <laughs> well, well, talk to their lawyers man yeah. now <laughs> and this is not the this is not the this is after hours right yeah yeah so okay good so i i can be somewhat risque yes. but i'm telling you their lawyers cease and desist orders They've got they've got their whole nest typing out notes saying you got to take this down. So, um, but Gary and I got copies of the report just probably day or two so days after, after it came out. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> probably two days after we submitted our our, yeah, our things. Yeah, I was I, was I, I didn't know it was supposed to be secret when I got it. You know, I mean, it's, really? Oh, wow. Well, well, yeah, because it was just it was just put out. That's that's what I was wondering what you were talking about. Because the thing was widely distributed all over the world. <laughs> well, I don't know who widely distributed it, but I know one thing for sure: it wasn't UBS. <laughs> they, they, it was, it was for their people. It was for their customers. And but the the good news is, um, this has definitely put UBS on the map, right? As far as uh, as far as uh, as far as studies are concerned. Um, first off, it's a it's a damn good study. Um, not just because we worked on it, but there were several analysts that worked on it to try and tie everything together to show the economy and the, and, and the projections and on, uh, on and on as far as electric vehicles are concerned. But your study surprised them because you came, when, when you tore down the, the Chevy Bolt, you found out that it didn't cost as much to make as they had right. thought it was. Yeah. And, and was it, okay, so explain first of all, like, why did they contract with you guys? I mean, so the, the point was not to see how to build a Chevy Bolt, it was to learn about EVs and uh, no, actually, out how much it, it, it wasn't that the at all. Service, they, right? they said uh, uh, I got a, a, a fellow named Colin from UBS phoned up and he said, um, "I I've heard that you guys do teardowns and 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 reverse engineering and maybe some costing too." I said, uh, "Well, you heard correctly." And um, and then he he started the conversation. Uh, you know, we'd like to try and do something, but we're not exactly sure what we want to do yet. But it might be the Chevy Bolt. And I said, well, they're going to be hard to get because, you know, they're not really sold in Michigan and on and on and on. I was, in essence, kind of like, mm, I don't really want to work with a bank. I don't know anything about banks. I, why, you know? And the next thing I know, um, um, he was uh, kind of, uh, he got the basic information. The next thing I know, there's a guy named um, Patrick Hummel uh, that's, uh, that's contacting us. And he is in charge of their research arm. And he phones up and he says, oh, I did some investigating. I found out you tore apart an I-3. So I talked to my friends at, at BMW. They're furious at you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so anyways, he says, you're we had furious for I-3. You'll be on this show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, furious yeah, for Bolt. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly. So who knows? Anyways, the, um, uh, at the end of the day, they, uh, uh, Patrick checked us out to make sure that the numbers we came up on, uh, on the I-3 were accurate. And they were confirmed by BMW, so that was happy. And um, and then um, and then they said, "Can you can you buy a Bolt? We're going to buy one in Massachusetts." I said, "Really? That's going to be tough because this is like the middle of winter. It was the beginning of winter." And I said, "That's going to be kind of tough. I, I don't think they're selling there uh, yet." He 
says, oh, I'm sure we got one. Then he came back and says, oh, I guess we can't get one. <laughs> so we have brokers and, and they found one. And I said, well, we can pick it up, but it's not going to come in at, uh, I don't know what they wrote. Was it 35,000, 37,000? 37, 37, yeah. 37.5. Well, it ain't, it's not coming in at no 37.5. We're going to have to pay it about 52 to get it. And, and we're going to mark it up. Why because 52? Because brokers need to make money. Oh, okay. So it's see, it's, it's everybody wants to make money nowadays. It's Plus, like uh, now, the thirty-seven five, uh, thirty-seven thousand five hundred dollars. That that's the base price. If you want like the the level three plug, that's like another eight hundred bucks. Oh, on that's top of it. That's and, uh, that's more than you mean the the one for uh, for for DC. It's more expensive than that. It's a uh, it's an option that's but a you, little. But it's, you paid a broker who wasn't in California. To get one there and bring it back here. Or it was he, the the broker I think was in California and, and then he shipped it to us. So it was wouldn't, like fifty. Wouldn't it be cheaper thousand. just to fly out there, Sandy, and buy one and drive it back? You be you know, paying the bills. <laughs> <laughs> miles. I'd have had to have night. I'd have had to have you nineteen. You got to stop, stop at night. Holy shit! You got to be kidding me. <laughs> you got to stop at night. That. See, but John is right. You, you know, he's working with a bank, a newspaper, or something. Yeah. Anyway, but you got to no, stop at night, Sandy. Like you're gonna sleep. Like you know. It, it, do you know how long it takes to, to get that thing up the charge? When you, you, you with a one you ten, got killed on this with thing. a one ten, and that's all we had was a one ten. Sixty hours. Sixty hours. That's correct. What? Sixty hours. Six zero. It's wow. eight hours if you have two twenty, and an hour and a half if you've got the uh, really eight hours at two twenty. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. So it's a big battery. Long, I, I, I wouldn't have just. I didn't realize it was that long. Detroit. I thought okay. I could have flown it cheaper. That's Anyways, true. so we got the um, car. We got the car. So uh, we got like into it, and you know, I hadn't too much good to say about the Volt when it first came out. We should start calling it the V and the B because there is that, nobody. Yeah, yeah. Do you know That's, what? There's something else. Do you know that there's no differentiation between a V and a B in the in, with the Chinese, and the Japanese, and the Korean? They can't tell the difference at all. There is no difference to them. Somebody better think about it. If they want to export that car, they better start calling it something else. You know, the uh, the lightning bolt or something like that. But uh, but not. The, so anyway, um, we got the car, and I wasn't a big fan of the Volt. I I said some things that really uh, upset the guys at GM. But they were true. I mean, the amount of money that they sunk into that thing was astronomical. When the Bolt came in, we looked at it and we said, oh, hey, a lot of this stuff is carryover or from the parts bin and stuff like that. Then we started looking at how they actually did the job. And, and it was a complete, here you go, LG Chem, you got it. Give us a battery. We'll give you the design for the motor. You build the motor, build the gearbox. Oh, we want all the controllers. Everything, everything is LG Chem, everything. And that's the way, if you wanted to, if you want to, you know, get the price down and you want to get it out in a hurry, give it to somebody that, you know, does this on a daily basis. And that's what wound up happening. So LG and Samsung are our two favorite uh, uh, battery suppliers, and both of them know how to do the controllers and stuff like that. So it was a... It was, I thought it was a, a pretty good move on GM's part. So I threw them under, I threw them under the bus for the V. But the B, as far as I'm concerned, well I, done, I see a lot. I see a lot of good things. Plus, the price of the battery pack went down. Uh, you know, it's been. Yeah, a what is their while. price per kilowatt hour? Did, did, have you gotten down to that the level? Price per kilowatt hour. Well, I, I can uh, remember it was $145 for the cell, but your study says $207 for the pack. I mean, the, the, you know, yeah. the when cells we, in the pack. Yeah. And cell cost is what everybody talks about. Everyone yeah. talks cell cost, but you really got to talk pack. You do costs. have to talk pack because you. Yeah. And the pack and cost, if I remember yeah, you, right you, from your study, was. You probably remember it better than I do. So, um, but anyway, yeah, we, we, we calculated everything. But the best news was we got lucky enough to, to talk to people at LG who wanted to uh, find out some information on something else. They didn't have any budget to pay for it. So I said, hey, yeah. Uh, so we know that our numbers are pretty close. Uh, they, nobody's going to give you the exact number, but it, I know that it's pretty close. But this was a car out of the parts bin, basically, like a cruise platform, heavily modified, yeah. a lot of parts out of the bin. Yeah. And then they had a supplier do the entire battery. The yeah. propulsion system. Yeah. But the, I mean, Power electronics, how, everything. That's kind of smart, isn't it? Isn't that kind of a I'm good idea? Oh, the, the big problem is, is that 60% of the content now, 60% of the value of the content, is is LG Chem? LG Chem's got more money in it than than uh, than than Chevy does. 
GM does. But that's pretty much true of any car these days. You know, when you and not I got... Not in one lump. Well, no, well, not nobody. in one lump. No, I, I would agree with yeah. that. But when, you, when we all got into the business, the car companies generated 70 to 80 percent of the value of a car, and they bought 20 to 30 percent. That's yeah. completely flipped today. Well, except so. for Toyota. Toyota still has higher... Uh, Huge. Unbelievable. Oh, no yeah. But... At the end of the day, they have the biggest pot of money as well, so uh, they can afford to, to do whatever they want, and who's well, going to argue with them? Well, it depends how you count, too, right? Because with the Kiretsu system, they own uh, yeah. a controlling interest in companies like Denso and Eisen yeah. and the like, so right. depending on how you're counting... Well, that's what we count. We just okay. look at it. If they own more than 50%, right. then, then that's in Toyota. House. I don't care. Yeah. Okay. And then in the study, it actually says that Denso is going to be one of the companies that's going to be coming out on top in terms of uh, yeah. the electrification of things. Right, right. So, so let's go back to the, the B car. Yeah. And one of the first things you found out is that, or at least UBS did, is that the cost to make these electric cars was several thousand dollars four, cheaper than what they thought. Yeah, four grand. Yeah, four, four grand years. cheaper. Yeah, and, that, and that's ma mainly because of the battery technology has come along. I mean... It's going to be really cheap when we get to uh, 811. Right now, the ratios, I think. Um, What's 811? This is the cobalt? Uh, yeah, the cobalt. If you can drop the cobalt content, I, th I can't remember the. I, I don't want to guess, but. Uh, but if you get the report, anyways. <laughs> if, if, if you got so the they're, say, they're saying if you, yeah. you eight, right now it's eight one one and the plan is. No, no, to go no. To, it's it. No, we want to go to eight one one. I thought it was to go to one one one. No, because then cobalt and and uh, and uh, nickel and and lithium would all be the same. You want eight times of the lithium and as little cobalt as absolutely possible. So the cobalt acts like glue and um, and that's your safety agent. And if uh, if you can figure out how to get rid of, I don't know if you're aware of it. I I didn't know this, but uh, cobalt mostly comes from um, uh, the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, and um, that's not what you'd call a great stability uh, uh, in, um, in, in uh, political terms and whatnot. So they're going through another election and everybody is holding their breath because that could really, that could really slow things down. Usually when they have election, they also have a revolution to go along with it. It's like, you know. Hey, so. we're, we're gonna have to take a quick break in a minute. Before we do, let's get to one of the first questions that came in. Peter wants to know, how long did it take to do the teardown of the Chevy Bolt? Well, we didn't tear down everything. We only tore down the, uh, the power pack, and I would say that it was probably about three, three and a half months, and that was including uh, writing the report. So they wanted it in a hurry, and, and uh, we put extra folks on it. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, look, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to be back with Sandy talking a whole lot more about the stuff. But right now, we're going to give a shout out to our good friends at Bridgestone. Okay, we're back with Sandy Monroe. So, David, you were asking something, where, right? I think I cut you off. Yeah. So, so you've turned down the i3 and the Bolt. In terms of battery pack chemistry and, and that sort of thing, the, the i3 was done a couple of years ago. Has the chemistry, has the technology advanced? Has cost come down greatly? Like, what, what do you, what's the, you know, what do you see then versus now in these two cars? Um, well, okay, so when we tore down the i3, uh, prior to tearing down the i3, I was enamored with the uh, LG uh, batteries. I thought they were the best on the planet. When we got the BMW i3, then all of a sudden we saw a better battery battery chemistry. We also saw, a, saw they have a better uh, or more cost-effective um, um, battery manufacturing system than what uh, so than what Samsung. Uh, L, yeah, Samsung than what LG Chem had. Now, uh, as far as the cost differential, uh, there's a little bit, but. Not much. The big thing is going to have what, what's really going to make, make a big difference, I think, is the uh, is the impact of uh, trying to get to 811. If they do that, if if whoever gets to that point, or if they both get to it at the same time, then you're going to see a reduction in the amount of cost. Because although everybody worries all about um, lithium, there's there is tons of it. It's like it's 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 a rare earth, but rare earth material, but it's not really rare. So one of the things that came out of the report was they're talking about how there could be parity with internal combustion engines in Europe yes. within, like, Next 2025. Year? No, no, I thought they said 2018. 2018, but 2025 is when they think that 
it'll be like 50 50 or something like that. Well, so well what they were saying in, in the 2025 is that automakers would be able to make a, a 5% margin on right. cars. Right. Well, that's. That's it. As far as I'm concerned, if you can't make any real money at it, then why you do it? Yeah, why bother? But is that uh, realistic, Sandy? By 2025, you can make five percent on electric cars. Yeah, Ibetta. Yeah. So that that's kind of what uh, that's that's really, you know, we we gave them what the prices are right now, and we told them what we thought about projections on different materials and and whatnot. Uh, but but they went through and uh, manipulated the numbers so that they could figure out okay, gasoline prices are this in, in Europe, and the general buying population is here, and the infrastructure will be there, and blah, blah, and here we go, boom. Because if you're in the city, um, uh, if you're in a, a major, maybe not a major city, London is going to have a problem, but if you're in a, a city of some size but not gigantic, um, an electric car is going to be wonderful for you. Uh, it, it'll be cheaper than gasoline or diesel fuel. Um, the price parity as far as, uh, and it's not price parity as in my electric car and my gas and engine car are the same. It, it's more like the cost of ownership. So, and that's what I should say yeah. for 2018, isn't it? and that's what yeah. the report said. Total right. cost of ownership, TCO, right. mm -hmm. would right. be right. on a par in Europe next year. And, and in Europe, why? Because it's still seven bucks a gallon right. for gasoline exactly. in Europe. Exactly right. And in 2025, now you have cost parity, real cost parity. That's what they're predicting. And, and I, and I kind of agree with that for Europe. Uh, in China, uh, 2020 and 2027, I think, were the dates. And in the United States, they put something down, but it doesn't matter because it's a lie. <laughs> nobody, nobody in the states is running out to buy their 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 electric car. It just what's the latest and greatest sanity on how quick, quick charge will get a battery like the Bolt fully charged? Like the Volt or Bolt, Bolt rather? Bolt, yeah. Okay, so uh, an hour and a half right now, if you're using a direct a DC charge, uh, that's that's what you're that's the you're fastest. Win. You that's can the get. fastest wow. But. But if you go to a 400 volt system or a 400 volt battery, like what Porsche is doing, now you can do it in 15 minutes. Wow. Okay, just don't get too close. Children, don't <laughs> lick that plug. I'm or, telling you, you're not gonna like it. <laughs> then, when, when you talked about the i3, you talked about this car in, in the context of almost being Model T-like in its yeah. ability to transform the industry, because as you No, no, use, no, I said technology. Well, that's the technology was so dramatically, and still is. Nobody's got anything like the i3, nobody. It's just too bad it was so ugly. If only, if they would have made that look like a, like a three series BMW, they'd be selling us the, the daylights out of it. Could they have they packaged didn't. it and made the car look? Uh, the way they want it, I mean, that's, you know, all these cars, all of the cars, except for what Tesla's done, and this is why Tesla has such a great brand, they've all been kind of gawky or boring hatchbacks. The Bolt, pretty boring hatchback. I3, kind of gangly. Leaf, Prius. another boring hatchback. I mean, all... Prius has been, you know, it's a geek car. It's, but look, you know... at, look at the Tesla, Falcon doors. Ooh. I mean, everything about the S, people like, everything that comes out of Tesla, mm -hmm. They're looking at, that's my primary market. <laughs> I, I have to make money on this. Everybody else, um, we have to have an electric car. Oh, put old dead Steve on it and, and get <laughs> some, you know. That, that's not the way you want to do this. It, I think that, um, you know, what do I know? I'm not in charge of GM or Ford, but if I'm going to put something out, I want it to look red hot. Do so you think I, they missed I, an I, opportunity with the Bolt in terms of styling and... Total no, appeal. I think that uh, I think that the market is still slow, and probably what they did will be just fine. They didn't spend too much money on it. They they used uh, their internal uh, parts bin and uh, modified something that they got. They can build it on the same assembly line. It's not a new assembly line, and they put a few through, and and that's kind of like what they did. It's probably something more for marketing than it is for. It's regulation. Getting They've every, got to meet yeah. the California ZEV mandate, the right. zero emission vehicle rules. Right. So Armin wrote in, he says, uh, it was estimated that GM loses $9,000 on each seven. bolt it makes. Well, you, you found differently. Seven, seven grand. Loses yeah. about seven grand on each But, bolt. I mean, okay, once I got rid of my sunk costs and blah, blah, it, it'll start to make money. It depends. Personally, I, I wouldn't buy it. It's not my kind of car, and it's not pretty. 
Uh, so it wouldn't attract me. But there are people who will buy a Chevy. That's especially if you're, you know, you're in town. You, it's it's. It's just fine if, if you don't drive Listen, too we, much. We here have all driven the car. I think it's a fantastic car I, to drive. I, drove I love well. the thing. I'm I, I'll you. tell you what, from a drive standpoint, yeah. I did better than the i3 because um, you, the, I didn't have the thing dialed in properly on the i3. Take your foot off the gas and you went right through the windshield. Okay, that, that really didn't make me happy. Right yeah, there. the regen and braking was a little bit aggressive. Well, aggressive. So I, I like the Bolt as well, or the, yeah, the Bolt, the B. I, I like the Bolt as well. I, from a driving standpoint, I drove it around a little bit. Hey, this is pretty nice. Everybody did. Nobody came back with anything disparaging. We, we, we have a thing we call the FFQ, the Fit Finish Quality Assessment. It's a non-intrusive kind of thing. And it's more geared toward uh, um, subjective feelings uh, than, it is, uh, than it is really objective analytics. And it came back with uh, a pretty high score. It it, it, it works. It, it does what it's supposed to it do. It is a nice car. It's and just, it makes it's it's a hatchback. It's a compact. You know what is this market absolutely running from? Hatchback compacts, and you know th th that's why the appeal is limited. But I think you're right. I think they wanted. They knew they were going to lose a lot of money on every one. I've been told nine. You know, UBS is estimating 7,500. It's kind of all in the same ballpark. It's, you know, losing a few hundred or a thousand bucks on a compact car is unacceptable to car makers these days. So it's a lot of money to lose per car. So they don't want to sell a lot of them because you just lose more money, but they will meet their regulations. They'll learn something. And then as battery costs come down, they'll be ready to go out with something that's, you know, Do you, do you think General Motors learned as much as BMW learned? Well... Uh, you mean from a total technology prospect? Mm -hmm. No, because nobody nobody's got anything even close on the on the in the market right now as far as technology is concerned. To the i3. To the yeah. i3. The i3 is vastly superior from a technology standpoint to pretty much anything. But um, who wants to sink that kind of money? I mean, they threw they threw billions at it. The good news is is that. that I mean, now they're making uh, carbon fiber for, uh, for uh, Boeing. They, they had one carbon fiber plant, uh, plant in, uh, in uh, Moses Lake. Now State they've got a second one, yeah. and they're putting a third one right next to it. Uh, so maybe they didn't make money on the car, but I, I guarantee you they're making money on other things. And uh, selling, uh, selling carbon fiber is, uh, is one of them. Actually, did I show you guys this stuff? No, what do you have? Here, this is, um, oops, and that's the advanced stuff. This is what it looks like before you start throwing. Um, um, well, I've seen this out of your So this is clothes. woven carbon fiber. It looks like, it's you know. It's woven and stitched. So that's sewn together. So the stuff comes out really, really thin, and then you put a bunch of layers on it, and you it weave it. It looks like, you know, almost something that you'd put under a carpet, you know. Yeah, like, uh, shoddy. Shoddy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's what we, that's what you have. That's how the uh, BMW i3 is made, something like that. And then uh, it goes into RTM, resin transfer molding. But this has really got me excited. This is, um, this is a sheet molded compound. Now that's, um, that's got a uh, honeycomb inside of it. Uh, but uh, to me, that's the way to go. I would jump past this, uh, what, what BMW Well, explain did. the difference. So you, well, you don't take one, the shoddy and, and put well, RTM. Well, it, it has that, but it's not as thick as this. And it's made very, very thin, okay? And then you put the uh, honeycomb in there until you have it on both sides. Now, I've got a structure that's a lot stronger. Okay, so in the olden days, uh, when I was young, and you drew on a drafting board, we needed drafting boards that were huge, right? So some of them were, um, uh, mine was, mine was, um, was a four by eight, okay? Yeah, four by eight. And, um, and that's, a, that's a big drafting board. Well. If I put that onto the normal stands, it, it wouldn't take it. But we would take, you know, one eighth uh, plywood. We put a honeycomb in the center. Now all of a sudden, the uh, stands would be able to lift it up and down, no problem. It was lightweight and whatnot, and, and plenty strong. Never warped, never did anything. Same thing on this. this only it's really hard. Yeah. So you're saying make a sandwich. So you it's have you, so yeah. you basically have the carbon fiber material on the outside. On both, on both outside, yeah. so like a sandwich, and then. Right. But what is the stuff in between? Well, that's the secret sauce. Oh. Um, and I, I, like I said, a lot of people come to us with technologies, um, and some of them want us to tell us a little bit about it. 
not many of them want us to tell everything about it. So you're not going to tell us what the so, honeycomb's made out of? No. <laughs> so, so but that's <laughs> very astute. Yes, yes, yes. So this is being used by someone or this? Yeah. S somebody's building. Did you guys develop this? this? this. Yeah, cars. <laughs> they're building. They're building uh, special uh, sports cars with that. That kind of stuff. Yeah. Is it really expensive compared to forty-seven thousand? And the reason that so you're they talking use Formula this, One technology. Uh, no, it's not Formula, Formula One. Forty-seven thousand wouldn't get you a tire. But the um, <laughs> but this this is being used on specialty sports cars, and um, and they're selling for forty thousand, forty-seven thousand. Euros, okay, and um, you're saying the and, car is 47. You're saying just that's 47,000 worth of material in every that's car. That's the whole car. Here's whole the car, car. Okay. 47,000 okay, euros. Sounds like Alpha 4C to me. I couldn't tell you. Anyways, <laughs> so at the end of the day, somebody's doing this right now. People are doing this right now. And if we get to the VT vertical takeoff machines, that is what I oh, would. Oh, and we got we got to be talking about that. But we got to take another commercial break yet, and then we're going to come out of that. We've got a Dr. Data coming up as well. But I, I want to talk. You, you say vertical takeoff machines. We're talking drones. And no. No. Okay. Okay. Well, hold I, it. Hold well, it. Well, okay. Hold it. Because we're going to take a break to pay for these guys. Yeah, I mean, we, yeah, yes, you do. Actually, they pay for us, and we're going to give a shout out to our good friends at Lear right now. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts, all delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com to be able to make them okay we're back we're back and this is the part of the show where dr data is going to make an appearance okay so so this time we the last couple times we didn't we didn't have a graphic for you guys to guess at so as you guys may not know i think you know that i put a number up there and you try to determine what that number means or what it represents so carmen could you please bring up the first number so it's one million per day Ah, oh, I know no, what it is. You're, you're, you're get, yeah, it's a, I'm not going to say. Any, any idea what one million mm, per day might day. be? Something happens one million times a day now. Oh, it happens already. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> the, uh, the UBS study gets, uh, gets downloaded. Many, yeah. <laughs> gets, yeah, downloaded one million times a day. All right. Okay, let me guess. All right. That's going to be the number of battery cells that need to be manufactured for electric vehicles. If only, right? And the answer is, oh, so last week Lyft announced that it's doing one million rides oh. per day. That's a and, lot of rides. And, and apparently Uber is doing like five times that many. I was actually gonna, gonna guess that it was Uber, but I, it, even one, one million seemed high even for Uber to me, but. Uh, yeah, so it's one million for Lyft per day, and they're only in the United States. Yeah. So, you know, in the... What's uh, Didi doing in China? Well, we were in... Uh, Didi have a thing going, so I'm not well, sure that they Didi don't count the... Well, Didi bought out Uber. Yeah, in China. In China. Yeah, yeah they bought the... They, they had a Chinese JV and... Right. And, and but Didi bought so Uber's sort of share. Like out, what? So Nobody uses cabs anymore. When I go to China, uh, I don't know if we're going to talk about that, but when we have an operation in China now, we don't use anything but Didi. We have to get our own phones because you... In order to make the bank accounts and everything work, you've got to have a Chinese phone, a Chinese bank account, and then it's kind of like you drive wherever you're going to drive to, beep, and that's it. You walk out, everything's done. I love it. It's mm -hmm. like so does it's this fabulous. replace car ownership in the U.S., Sandy? What What's do you that? think? Will, will Lyft and Uber ride sharing, ride hailing? Will that replace owning cars in the U.S.? Mm -hmm. I know a lot of younger people don't like, don't want to have a car, don't need a car, um, but I don't think. Like there's there's a somebody was saying that oh geez we're we're down to uh, we're not going to get a, an increase in car sales I was surprised that we got up as high as we did I mean I think that there's a level uh, that we can sell in the United States and I think it's somewhere between 16 and 17 million and I think that that's what you're going to see as the norm I, I don't think I don't think you're going to get as uh, in fact I think it's going to probably diminish because kids don't care right. they don't care. Yeah. So, so Alex Partners did that study that they announced at the Automotive mm -hmm. Press Association yesterday yeah. in saying that, you know, if you're using Zipcar, that takes 19 cars 
out of the, the fleet, you know, each one of those. Right. But, only, car, but, only, but, only, but only four for Lyft or Uber, so, you know, it isn't so bad. Yeah, their conclusion was that it, it, it will take a little bit out of new car sales, but not a lot, because right. one, you know, one of the reasons Uber and Lyft are so popular is, and, and every one of us travels for work, there are a lot of under-taxied cities. Yeah, you just, I mean, it's I mean, look, one of them. You're in Vegas for a convention, if you, I've always rented a car because you'll stand outside in front of any casino for an hour waiting for a cab. Yeah. So an Uber or a Lyft is a much better way to go. And that's true in a lot of, I mean, look, San Francisco and New York had plenty of taxis, but a lot of cities, it's just, you have to call and reserve one like it's a limo, so, which is what Uber and Lyft are doing by app. And look, the old cab guys should be kicking themselves for not just hiring an app developer 10 but years But, you know, ago. Manhattan was never under-taxied, and there's never. now more no. Uber cars that's in correct. Manhattan than there are yellow cabs. Yeah. It, I, know, I think people like the convenience. A, I think they like using an app. I yeah, think exactly. there's, there's a lot more, especially mm -hmm. amongst millennials, who would never get caught going into a oh, taxi okay. and when so, you just lift so an Uber all day. Uber's, Uber's a service in a lot of cities that didn't have a lot of cabs, especially for people who want to go out for a night in the town, uh, ride to the airport, all that kind of stuff. It will replace yellow cab in cities like New York because yellow cabs in the stony. Who wants to stand on a busy New York street corner, compete with the other three people standing on the same corner to hail a cab, especially if there's any kind of weather? I mean, yellow cab should have come up with something like this a long time ago. The real question is, does it replace car ownership, and does that reduce auto sales overall? And it, it's, I, you know, after that Alex Partners presentation, I talked to their consultants, and, and they're, you know, we know these guys, John Hoffecker is a very smart guy, and he said, look, it's just, it's impossible to model, because, yeah, some people will go from two cars in their household to one and rely on Uber and that sort of thing, but then those cars that are, they're going to churn through the system faster because they get a lot more miles on them, and someone has to build that car. It's not like Uber and Lyft are going to build their own cars. They, they want nothing to do with that. They don't even want to maintain them. Yeah, they, they don't, don't want to maintain want... a fleet. No. Yeah. So is, is it an opportunity, Sandy, from, from like an engineering of, you know, a purpose-built vehicle for things like car sh ride hailing? There's, there's already purpose-built. I mean, you can go to a London cab and you, there's a purpose-built uh, vehicle. Um, that, that would work just fine. They have but an electric out now. They announced that this week. There's an electric London cab. Yeah, I actually saw one. Uh, actually, uh, we... We w actually not yellow cab, but black cab, uh, they call them in, in London. Mm -hmm. And so I was there two days ago. Well, I was there yesterday, but uh, two days ago, we needed to get from point A to point B in a hurry. Black cab, psh, hey, and jump in and away you go. And it was electric. No noise. Now, is, is that owned by the Chinese now? Yeah, I have no clue. That's what I thought. Yeah, no, it is. It's a Chinese owned. So it's not English engineered electric cars. I, don't, we know how I, much I gotta tell you though, um, we're, we're missing out, okay? We talked about Uber. So I don't know who to say, but uh, could you put the, uh, that vertical takeoff, the one that says Uber on the side? Yeah. Uber is uh, Uber's looking for the... So what do you make of this, of uh, impact on the auto industry if people start using... Okay, here it is. Okay, so here it is. So here, this is Detroit Aircraft Company. Guess where they're located? And nobody knows about these guys. No, who are they? So, they're located in Detroit? Yeah, they're at Detroit Airport. So... John, uh, John Romanelli asked me to, you know, can you show this? And I, oh, so and this I said, this is like I would. the tilt rotor, really. Yeah, it is. It's like it's like an Osprey or a or a BAE. Uh, yeah, the V twenty two. Yeah, the the um, uh, this product, um, this product um, has um, somewhere it says Uber on there. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it says on the glass. Uh, oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay, so Uber is uh, is really excited about this. The guy at Uber um, that's, that's running that department, uh, remember when I did an airplane? Uh, I, oh, I, I saw the, the paradigm. Yeah. So this, just so the audience knows, this was an autonomous personal aircraft. Right. Seats five. Seats five, and you didn't know, have to know anything about flying. All you had to do was bring it out to taxi it out to the runway, and it would fly from there. That's exactly right. You did and, have to know how to use a parachute. <laughs> <laughs> it had a parachute in it. Why bother with individual parachutes? Put one parachute and it float the whole plane down. So it, it had everything you needed to have, right? And in 2008, when we were ready to rock with this thing, what did people say? Oh, uh, no pilot. Oh, that's impossible. And now we got, and there's a thousand feet of separation between planes. And I got people telling me, oh, they're going to smash into each other and everybody's going to die. A thousand feet. How much now for an autonomous car? 
car. I can't even talk. I'm getting so choked up. I mean, we're looking at two feet, two feet. And, and you're running around at, at, at 89 well, miles of, an hour. A lot of people may not realize that commercial aircraft are basically autonomously flown. I mean, yeah. they can fly and land themselves. I mean, the pilots yeah. are doing the work, but they can. So you're... They do, So actually. that thing we're looking at, what, I mean, so what's the plan? Oh, that, oh, oh yeah. Here, that's, here. that's the oh, paradigm yeah. right there. That was the... the we bought, we put a... Uh, uh, Chevy V8. Yeah. It was a Corvette, Corvette engine. Corvette engine. engine, yeah. And uh, we got that thing to, uh, to actually... Um, that thing actually uh, would take off without any problems. We needed 750 pounds of thrust. We had 1,000, and that thing was only kicking up at around, uh, I think it was like 3,200, 3,300 RPM. So you know what? That engine's going, ah, are we going to ever get going? You know? Really? Uh, yeah, seats five. It was, it was a fabulous idea. Trouble was, nobody was. I used to tell people, you know, when I was a kid, I went down to Hudson's, and they had a guy that ran the elevator because it was too dangerous for anybody to just push the button. So, <laughs> at the end, I still so now, that, now we're looking at. Yeah, you should right, see him sweating in an elevator. He doesn't go to Hudson's. It's embarrassing. Anyway. I wouldn't even ride an oh, elevator with yeah. him. So anyway, <laughs> this, these aircraft, these new ones, these these new VTOs, they got the same thing. Okay, they are exactly the same, and um, and there's some flying already. But you don't need runways. I mean, don't need anything because it's a VTOL. You can... I can drop it down in your backyard as long yep. as you don't have a swimming pool or something. I can drop it down in your backyard. That seats five or six, and you get in. Uber says, "Oh, you got a big party, and you want to go to Chicago." See, if we go back to that thing, that's uh, that's another one. This is the one that's in Germany. Okay, these are, uh, um, again, uh, uh, another form of veto. They, they're also electric. Both those planes are electric. One has eight motors. One has, uh, bidi bidi, uh, I think, 40 or 50. I can't remember. But at the end of the day, you're looking at the future there. Battery so electric? What, or Battery uh, electric, yes. Really? Well, you can't have an extension cord, John. I know, it's just I know. too long. Well, I, I know, but I was wondering if it'd be hydrogen. You know, you fuel oh, that would be even better, but right now, nobody's... It's one of those garden hose things. Actually, yeah. if someone would pay us to do an analysis on the, on the Toyota, uh, I bet you we could figure out how to make... Because uh, my guess Take is... Take the Mirai of yeah. fuel cell and stick it yeah. in one of these VTOLs. So, um, attention banks. Sandy yeah, yeah. is ready. <laughs> yeah, attention banks. Actually, no, um, A2 Mac 1 and I were going to do it. Uh, A2 Mac 1 is sometimes a competitor and sometimes not. But we were going to do it. They, were gonna, they had it torn one apart, and, and we started looking at it, and we went, oh, my God. If, it, if I had it right from the beginning, I could have probably done it. But there was... It was taken apart too deep, and we just passed on it anyway. Because we all looked, <laughs> we all looked at how well I did on the i3 and said, screw it. So, um, uh, but, but that would be a better route to take because it's lighter, a much, much lighter package. Well, well, uh, Geely just bought the uh, flying car company. Yeah, Terra, Terra Fuga. Fuga. Yeah. Oh, I was going right? to bring I didn't know that. Well, yeah, huh. yeah, Terra Fuga just went. So uh, guess what? My guys are all, we always go to uh, Oshkosh. And now uh, the two head guys from uh, uh, Geely that are in charge of everything, but kind of like interested in Terra Fuga, they're coming with um, with um, our our lady that runs the president of Monroe, China. She's uh, she's bringing them to uh, Detroit, and then uh, uh, Sid, Sid Siddiqui, one of my guys, he's going to take him in his commander and fly him to uh, to Oshkosh. So this is the Experimental Aircraft Association yeah, is, annual yeah, right. Right. wacky big, plane thing. The biggest fly-in in the world. Like uh, you go from Oshkosh, which has got what eighty people or something, uh, to uh, to about three quarters of a million. It's big, huge. Wh where's the big one? That's Oshkosh. Oh. oh. Because there's so many people flying in, the population grows un oh, unbelievably. Oh, I see what you mean. I'm yeah, not yeah, kidding yeah. you when I said three quarters of a million. It's it's a huge fly-in, and every type of plane you could ever imagine. Some of them are kind of wacky, but uh, there's every World War One, World War Two, Korea, any any kind of war. If it if it flew, there's one of them there. So so I mean, given the fact that Geely is bought in it, what they those guys started in Massachusetts or something like that, Terra yeah, Fuga yeah. and and out of MIT, I think. And yeah, I mean, do. does this does this give you hope that there will be flying cars? Personally, I I really never bought into um, Terra Fuga because the wings fold up and they they go beside the car and 
Um, it's a I bad plane and it's a bad car. It's, there's a lot of things I've got to try and get through NISHTA and I've got to try and get through um, uh, uh, the FAA. Um, and I don't see either one of them being real happy about anything. So to me, uh, we can help them so they can actually produce it and probably we change things. But, uh, but for me, the, uh, the VTO is the right way to go. It's electric, number one, um, and I can get it to go 200 miles an hour and I could probably easily get, um, you know, I could probably get five, 500 miles out of the thing, something like that. I mean, we're, How we're looking How high do those at, fly, Sandy? Huh? How high do those fly? I, well, actually, you'd pass out before, because they're not pressurized. So if you get above 17,000 feet, I don't know why you'd want to do that anyway, because it's made for, you know, short takeoff and landings, right. they, they, you, want, you want to be in a city. Like, I see New York, fabulous opportunity. Any of the big cities with a, with a lot of flat roofs. That, that and would a be lot of traffic. And a huge amount of traffic. You know, New York. Uh, Car traffic. I, I forgot how bad things are in New York and London. I haven't been to London or New York for a long time. Normally, I get up real early, get to where I need to get to, spend all day there. And then, you know, by 10 o'clock, we're leaving. And so I don't see it. But this trip... Uh, we were in the middle of New York, and it, it's, like, unbelievable. That's the perfect opportunity for making, uh, making a tremendous amount of money. So if I was going to put my money someplace, if somebody said, well, do you want to make an electric car? No. Do you want to make a car that looks like an airplane or an airplane that looks like a car? No. What about doing a fuel cell? No. But if somebody come along and said, hey, how about... How about we make uh, a vertical takeoff that will bring people from point A to point B and no pilot is required? Where do I sign? Because if I can make that work, I will make a whole new market and I will kick the daylights out of everybody else. I think, personally, it won't happen in the U.S., but I think, well, right now, I can't really talk about all of them. Okay, so Geely, we, yeah, it's in the press. But there's four other companies in China that are already doing this. Four. So Geely makes five. How many in the U.S.? Because we're the technological leaders. Right after somebody else does it and gets it running, we will be right there. I guarantee it. We will be right there. We'll be, as they used to say at a company I once worked for, we will be second and better dressed. <laughs> okay. Yeah, tell me another. Okay, I want to pick up more on this thread you know, about why the U.S. isn't as aggressive as it used to be in these kinds of things. But we've got to take another break here. We're also going to look at a, a walk around that Gary just did uh, with Hyundai's uh, Sonata GT, right? No, 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 no. Just, this is the Sonata. So we'll be with the uh, chief designer of the Sonata. Oh, oh, okay. I'm getting my cars mixed up. But All first, right. going to take a quick break right now and take a look at Borg Warner. Borg Warner, developing advanced technology specifically aimed at reducing emissions, increasing fuel economy, and improving performance. Our award-winning innovations extend from turbocharging and cooling systems to friction materials and diesel cold start technology. Built on a century-long reputation of innovation and reliability, we have the track record that proves our technology can help meet the challenges of the commercial truck and off-highway industry. Okay, hold on. We'll, we'll, we'll get back to that number in a minute. But, Gary, we were just talking about you were out on the West Coast. Yeah, so, so, uh, yeah, so then the day before yesterday, I was in Julian, home of the famous pie company that everybody goes and eats pie at in Julian. And, and so we had the opportunity to uh, do a walk around of the um, major mid-cycle refresh of, of the Sonata. They basically have taken all the sheet metal and changed it to uh, try to amp up interest in the uh, mid-size sedan. You were talking about compacts having problems, sedans are having problems as yeah. well. As have you said, as you've said many times in the show, it's all about crossovers now as, as far as the market's going. So, so this is their attempt at, at Hyundai to uh, re-energize re uh, their, their midsize. Their sedan. Okay, let's take a look. 
We're here in Julian, California with the 2018 Hyundai Sonata and the chief designer for the studio based here in California, Chris Chapman. Chris, thank you very much. Now you guys competed, you guys competed for the design of this car. You won mm -hmm. for the design of this car. I want you to tell me the three things that are the coolest aspect of this. Well, it's design. a team effort. We always know that, right? But I would say beginning with the major refresh, you're always sort of focusing on the front end and the rear end of the car, but it actually is a great opportunity to kind of get a stance going on. So I'd say number one is the stance of the vehicle. It's sort of this runner out of the block, this sprinter out of the block, and it's especially frozen as soon as the gun shoots off when they jump out and their head turns up. And so what we've done is we've extended the hood of the car in the nose area here by quite a significant aesthetic amount in order to bring that nose a little bit more prominently forward and give it a more assertive kind of a feel. Swept back before. Now it was more. swept back before, now it's more upright. And that in conjunction with the rear end, which we'll get to in a second, is lean forward. It gives that sort of sprinter's kind of face. Okay. The second area is it's a major refresh in the front end of the car, and it begins with our new Cascade grill. We used to have a hex grill that we've had for a long time. Continuing on with the evolution of the fluidic sculpture themes that Hyundai has been known for, we have this sort of cascade grill that comes around from the top of the, top of the grill around and then does this sort of chicane or this S curve down to the lower part of the vehicle. And at the bottom of the vehicle, we have this sort of catamaran line that kind of lifts and levitates and lightens up the front. So you've taken a classic design cue that we've come to know from Sonata and, and accentuated it with yeah. some... Bring it into the future, okay. right? A little more motion. So there's, there's, a, there's a character line running along the body side here that you have a particular nomenclature for. Tell I us do. about it. Well, I call it the Saber line. It's coming from the previous generation, etc. It's got, it's quite an energetic line. Usually you see it from front three quarter, but it's really sort of the Saber line where it's this lunge forward and as soon as a Saber makes contact with an object, the Saber sort of bends, right? And so we have this wonderful kind of sculptural line there. That in conjunction with this classic Sonata Chrome uh, detail that goes through the belt line, through the hood cut, and into the headlight. The two lines together sort of juxtapose once against one another and form a nice little dynamic. So as we come back to the rear of the vehicle, the rear quarter, tell us about what you've done here. Well, it's a real four-door coupe kind of a line. The C-pillar extends all the way to the rear of the vehicle. It touches down right here, uh, accentuating a really short deck lid and a six-window configuration to the DLO ending really at the back of the rear tire and it really brings an elegant line to the car. And it helps move everything forward. Right. So, so this, this deck lid is an entirely different interpretation of what you've done before. Yeah, we really cleaned up the rear end of the car. It's most notable is when we move the license plate from this area right here, which is kind of a typical architecture down to the lower part of the, uh, of the car, cleans up the, the area. What I like to have is on my cars that I design really undisturbed sheet metal. Mm -hmm. So we've just got the badge in a wonderful sculpted area with the nomenclature here, very thin, slim tail light lines, and it really kind of helps bring an accentuated harmony like what we have in the front of the car in that sort of broken down third, third, third kind of power line. Thanks, Chris, for your explanation of what you've done to the 2018 Sonata design. All my pleasure. Interesting, Gary. So what, what, what do you think of the car overall? I can't tell you. Oh, it's still, <laughs> it's still under, under embargo. embargo. But what's very interesting, one of the things they did was, so for the rear camera, they've, they've put it down just above the license plate holder. So, so there is no, you know, how clean it looked back there. Yeah. And you also notice that there was, there was no, um, you know, nowadays nobody has a, uh, a lock cylinder in a trunk, right? And so it's all push button. But in the H, there's an area that you can touch. H of the Hyundai. The H of the Hyundai, which I learned was supposed to be two people shaking hands. That's the... Uh, the design of the, the logo. Yeah. Yeah, you told me that earlier, and I was like, what? I never heard that. Who knew that? So, anyway... Hmm. It's an interesting car. They've, they've spent a lot of money on that mid-cycle refresh. It sort of it reminds me of, remember when we, uh, we had the chief engineer of the Camry in here when they did that, you know, like changed every sheet metal part except for the hood, yeah. you know, as a mid-cycle. I think these guys are doing the same sort of thing. Well, you know, Camry and then uh, tomorrow, uh, Honda showing off the, the complete redesign of the uh, Cord. Right. So yeah, everyone's scrambling to try to preserve their mm. passenger car sales with new designs. What do you think? Is it going to passenger cars going to? Yeah, I think that's going to continue. Look, I think all the companies have to figure out how to make. You know, Honda already does it pretty well, but you, you've got to make something in that plant on that assembly line other than a mid-sized sedan, because demand is just going to keep going down. And you, 
and, and, and you've got to be able to make crossover SUVs or minivans or, or you know, combination of things off of that platform or, or you're in big trouble. Because it's, look, I like passenger cars. This is all good for me. The next time I go to buy a car, I'm going to get a $5,000 rebate on whatever I want. But <laughs> um, look, I, I think this, th there's a bigger issue with this whole trend of going to crossover SUVs, especially as you get into autonomy and stuff like that. First of all, crossover SUVs are not fun to drive. They're better than the old, you know, the, the, a, a 98 Ford Explorer in terms of ride and handling, but they're still not fun to drive. And if you think that mid-sized sedans from 50 feet away all look the same, crossover SUVs, you take a BMW and a Hyundai of the same size class, from 20 feet away they look the same. This is really commoditizing the automobile. So when autonomy gets here, this is something the car companies, why do I want to, you know, if you want to combat losing customers to pure ride sharing, there's got to be something special about owning your car and, and, and being in it. And if it's, if it's just a two-box crossover SUV with a 2.4-liter engine in it, you know, they all bore me to death. And I think they do, and, and, and you know, and I, I, you know but I, people like them because they're practical and you can fit a lot of stuff in them, which is great, but it's a total commodity, these vehicles. Very true. Couldn't agree more. Mm. Hey, uh, as I said before uh, the break there, Sandy, uh, you guys do great work at Monroe and Associates, and the Chinese are all over your company. They want all kinds of stuff for you to do for them. And it sounds to me like you don't get a whole lot of work out of American companies. Uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's an issue, I guess. Um, most of our work is, uh, is, uh, is European or it's Chinese. Very, very little is coming out of the U.S., very little. Now, that might change a little bit because we just got a big contract from uh, <clears throat> one of the local guys. But for the most part, um, China is huge. Uh, Japan is getting bigger, and in Europe um, is big, big for us. But China is, is our biggest market. Actually, there's a little slide that shows uh, our new place. We're going to be taking it over in... Uh, in um, what? You're moving to a new building? That's, didn't you just... Oh, you you in, just in, moved in, into oh, a giant yeah, building, no, but, but in that, China. See that oh, big China? China, the China one. So the other two buildings are... Uh, we already have those, um, but the China one is uh, spectacular. I didn't bring a lot of slides, but inside, these guys are giving it to us for three years for free. Um, we have the first floor, so we got about 24,000 square meters. It's about 24,000 square feet. If it's a square meter, just add a zero and call it a foot. So it's about 24,000 um, um, square feet. That's big. And it's relatively big, but um, one of the guys over there who would be normally considered a um, a competitor is asking, because there's a great big giant uh, elevator that would get us up to the second floor. They're trying to get us to get the second floor as well. Because with the work that they're looking at and there's the right ceiling heights and whatnot, they're really excited about it. But they're going to turn that thing into a bit of a palace for us. So, I mean, the floors are marble, I mean, or granite, I should say. I, 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 can't, I couldn't believe it. The walls are also going to be uh, granite. The, uh, uh, they showed us the conference rooms and, uh, the, and the restrooms and whatnot. This, this looks like a, like a five-star hotel, not a... So, so what are you going to be doing in this place? I mean, you're, you're, Same you're, thing as here. But I mean, oh, oh, you're, you're no. not just all about tearing apart no, cars. No, we're going to do... Most people know us about benchmarking and costing and things like that, but we also do a lot of new product development. So um, a lot of stuff I, I just can't talk about, but... But uh, one thing I can talk about is, is club car. We, we analyzed that car. We designed that car. We did That's everything on that golf, car. The golf car. The golf car, yeah. So that thing was 100% uh, Monroe and Associates. Not 100%, not but pretty close to 100% Monroe and Associates. We did everything to, to bring that thing to market. Came in making a lot of money. Uh, quality was astronomically higher than any other golf car. And it actually drove. I mean, it didn't like uh, it didn't feel like you were in uh, that little red wagon you had when when you were a kid. You know, being pulled along over a bumpy road, it was tough. This one had an actual suspension and whatnot, and it's still out there, and it still kicks the daylights out of the marketplace. It it's still the uh, golf car to buy. The other guys, um, one of them had much bigger uh, market share. Uh, they're almost uh, out of that business completely. So. 
Um, so we can do a good job, and we've done that with aircraft, and we've done it with medical devices and whatnot, where we, we will do a new product development for somebody using our so you, you guys have you guys have process knowledge yeah, and right. engineering knowledge right. and are able to bring these things together. Right. To and and usually when somebody's got something where they don't have enough time to get the job done, uh, they're dealing around and what, or they don't have enough money, it's cheaper for us to do it than it is for them to do it. That's one of the main reasons why Club Car hired us. They did an internal study to find out how much it was going to cost and how long it was going to take, and we beat that mm, so that we got the job. Same thing with medical devices and other things, especially nowadays with medical devices. Uh, the Obama regime was not good for the medical industry. That's why you see almost everything pulled out. Most of California, the California medical device companies, they've all buggered off. They've either shut down their engineering and they'll buy it from someplace else or they've moved it to one of their offshore locations like um, Costa Rica is a good spot for doing that sort of stuff now. but. But California took a mighty whack when, uh, when uh, all the rules and regulations came out under Obamacare. Mm. Yeah, you don't hear too much about that, but that, that's what. But we, we work on pretty much anything, and that's what they want us to do or help them with in China. They want us to help them get to the point where they can produce a car or anything else for that matter, but primarily it's focused on cars. How do we get, um, you know, a class A kind of car out the door faster. So How do John's we make point, why, why are you not hearing this from the US? I mean. Well, we're, we're much smarter here. We don't <laughs> need Sandy Monroe. Actually, that's what usually I get. Well, why, would, why, would, why would we want to go to you? We have thousands of engineers. We, we don't need you. And that's true, they do have a lot of engineers. Uh, but if you want to have something different in the marketplace, and all you're doing is looking at other people in your marketplace, and you get into something we call um, engineering incest. Okay, so I don't want to I don't want to throw rocks, but that that grill work um, did it remind you of another car? I'm uh, no, we can't say anything bad because <laughs> if we did that, we'd be insulting someone, and that's unfortunately uh, that's unfortunately the way things are in in the auto industry. Everybody copies. In the old days, they would, they, you know, they'd make commercials to tell you not to do that. That, that, that people are stealing their stuff nowadays. It the is the Audi nice. goes right, right across. This one goes down. So, okay, look, we're down to the very end here, but we got some good questions from the. I'm sorry, but we got to get to this. We got to get to it because okay. we've gotten some really good questions from the audience here, and, and we're going to have to do this rapid fire. Cameron Sauer says, "Heard anything about structural foams?" Yes, we have tons and tons of, uh, of uh, different types of structural foams. Um, uh, if we can get them to keep from catching on fire, that's, that's the big thing. Uh, but we use them all over the place on uh, military products. Okay, al Qaeda one says, another thing I like better on my Bolt than the i3 is that the i3 carbon fiber got really hot in the sun and took forever to cool down. That's because it's got... Um, the air conditioning system uh, for the bolt for the cab and for the cooling of the batteries is the same system, and I think it was undersized. Hmm. Uh, we got a phone call here, too. Uh, Carmen, let's bring that in. Dan from Georgia. Georgia. Hi, this is Dan in Georgia. I was wanting to ask Sandy about the cost of the electronics in the EVs and how he sees that coming down um, in the next few years. It seems that that's a higher cost of what an EV is than a regular uh, internal combustion car. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and actually, one of the main reasons why um, things are so expensive is because everything's been individualized. So your DC, DC, sorry, yeah, DC, DC converters, your DC, AC, AC converters, the inverters, the blah, blah, everything. They're all little disparate boxes. So one of the things, if, um, if we get to a point where somebody wants us to uh, help them reduce the cost of, a, uh, of, a, um, um, of a, a, an electric vehicle would be to uh, integrate those boxes together. You gotta bring the temperatures down because uh, they do get hot. But at the end of the day, why should I have four or five boxes this size when uh, I could probably put 
make it just slightly bigger and uh, and put all those boxes into one location. But that's that is a very very good question. Actually, that was the probably the number one question for the analysts in both um, in both in London and in uh, New York. Okay, B. Wilson for Web. Very interesting question here. Can you compare and contrast? the weight per kilowatt hour of the Tesla 2170 pack versus the Bolt pack. And he's got some follow-ups on this, too. Oh, follow what, what do you think of the 2170, the, the, the so-called <laughs> laptop batteries? You know, that used to be the 18650, now the newer one's out, the 2170. Okay, so we have not, we've taken apart pretty much every um, battery system on the planet. Uh, we have not done that one uh, because no one has requested it, no one. Oh, because th th here's another question. Peter says, surely there is great industry interest in a Monroe and Associates teardown of a Tesla Model 3. Has anyone commissioned you <laughs> to do a, three, a, a Model 3 teardown? Okay, so if this guy could help me out, I really need some help here. Can you get me one of those? Um, right now, I've got every Chinese company in China, every <laughs> yeah, car company one. <laughs> wants one, and they are willing to pay almost anything. So if you can get one, uh, please let me know, um, and we'll work out a deal. Yes. Yeah, and going back to the, the prior one about the 2170s, uh, let's see, he says he was most interested in comparing the current Tesla pack density to the Bolt because of the relative MPGE difference. And I'm not sure what that difference is. Mm. But he wants to know, is it battery chemistry? Is it tubular cells versus prismatic ones. Yeah, right, cylindrical. Anyways, um, cylindrical cells aren't as efficient, and the reason for that is because I can't get the density. So I want to have them tighter together. That's why prismatic is uh, a better way to go. However, uh, cylindrical cells are cheap, 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 because I all they are so. is a couple of, uh, you know, it's like a big jelly roll, right? And you're done. It's, uh, it's, it's wicked. It's a great idea. So is uh, Tesla smart for doing that then? Uh, they were initially. But now, uh, remember I was talking about Samsung? Samsung's figured out how to do that in a, in a prismatic form. So, uh, like I say, the, 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 the Samsung battery packs should be less money than the LG uh, battery pack. Um, but I, I can tell you, Samsung bought our... <laughs> our evaluation of their battery pack and came back and said, thank you very much. This is because uh, they, they had some, uh, some, some, something internal happened there and they needed to have an outside audit and it was much cheaper to buy it from us than it was to have it sent out and uh, have an audit done by somebody else. But we, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but uh, NISHTA, the EPA, CARB, they use uh, Monroe's numbers and we've been told we're irrefutable when it comes to, uh, you know, how good are our numbers. So we're very, very good at costing. Um, we didn't know how good until we started finding comparisons. Anyways, moving on. What? Oh, okay, <laughs> and the, one last one, one last one. And th this is something that you introduced the audience to several years ago. Steve B. wants to know, what the heck ever happened to covetic aluminum? I never hear anything about it anymore. Oh, lawyers. It's a problem. Um, uh, too many people were involved and um, everybody thought they were all millionaires and stuff like that. So um, I, haven't talked to, I haven't talked to anybody on Covetic for quite some time. The Covetic copper, the Covetic aluminum, the Covetic iron, the Covetic whatever, everything's wrapped up in lawsuits and uh, hard feelings and stuff like that. So uh, we have to wait another eight years. Oh, jeez. And then, and then it'll be wide open, right? Everybody will steal it. Actually, I already know that they're making uh, covetic uh, materials in China all over the place. Um, and there's some significant advantages to that stuff. Um, uh, so the Chinese are going to take care of it because they, <laughs> they don't care about patents. Um, and I know that uh, in Germany, they've cracked the code. They know how to do it. It is what it is, and we um, um, we had a uh, DARPA um, uh, project, um, a DARPA and a DOD project, uh, both uh, to make some of the stuff, um, uh, or at least try and show how it could be made, 
And uh, so my guess is that, uh, that the federal government, if they need it, they'll know how to make it and they'll do whatever they want uh, quietly because when it comes to that kind of stuff, uh, the government wins. Yeah. 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 Real good. We're going to have to wrap up unless anybody has got any last minute thing. Do you like fasteners any better than you used to? Huh? Do you like fasteners? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, Sandy actually, Holt hates nuts and bolts yeah. and screws. And no, I don't hate them. I just think that uh, that's just a sign that you're not much of an engineer. If you can figure out how to make it so that it clicks together, snaps together, if you can figure out how to uh, design a product so that you get rid of them because you can make it all in one. You were talking about additive manufacturing. I mean, that's going to put a lot of, especially on the low volume stuff, um, that's, that should put a lot of um, a lot of screw manufacturers give them nightmares uh, at night because I can make an egg now and actually you know uh, we do a lot of things for a lot of different people and you know if it's low volume and it doesn't take long to figure what low volume might products might be if it's low volume and you want it rugged like really rugged you can't beat that. and now I can I can make I can put you know, can make the outside shell out of uh, titanium or something. Inside, I can put plastic components. I can, I can stop the process, add circuits. I can, I can run, uh, you know, gold uh, uh, for for traces and stuff like. I can do a lot of stuff with additive manufacturing. Actually, that building where we're in, that's called the Maker's Building. So we have we have that one strip on the bottom with uh, 24,000 square feet. The rest of the building is Maker's all kinds of different ways of putting things into, into production. So, uh, yeah, the, again, where's the one in Detroit? Where's our makers building in Detroit? Well, we do have one in Highland, or, uh, Allen Park. Allen Park, right? Allen Park, how yeah. many people are in it? Is it as big as that thing was? No, it's not as big as that, no way. Uh, I, think, I think we better uh, figure, I mean, we've, we've been lucky, you know, um, every time there's a war, somebody, you know, somebody sinks one of our boats or blows up one of our uh, um, our seaports or something like that, and boom, we're in a war. And then we looks like we're losing, and then somehow we build it back up, and then we go right back to, you know, zero tech. I don't think you're going to be able to get that kind this the, because of everything's speed, the speed everything's moving now. I think it'd be a good idea if we pulled up our socks and tried to figure out how we're going to keep up or get ahead of the rest of the curve. We can't sell software forever. I totally agree with that comment, and that's a great way to end this show. Sandy Monroe, thanks so much for coming back on at AutoLine After Hours. Great having you. Great discussion here. Very good to be here. Thank yeah. you. David Welch, thanks for having you on the show, too. Really thanks, John. Great to be here. here. Great to be back. Yeah. And Gary, you and I are just going to keep on doing this. Yes, indeed. Okay. Next week, perhaps. Next week, yeah. Okay. want to thank all of you for having tuned in. Keep on keeping on. AutoLine After Hours is brought to you by... Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. And by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv. TV. Do that, uh -uh. He, and I can get any color you want. White's the toughest, but I can get any color you want. I uh, there's a wow a specialty tuner. It would Europe. be cool in a body. Oh, you kidding me? Oh my God! Can you imagine that if you made a two-tone car, like you made the body in black, not black, but white maybe or something like that and then you put the outside skin on because i don't need yeah. I, don't, I don't bmw doesn't need we're, we're still live but keep going yeah oh 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 i That's didn't know. so don't yeah. give her anything away yeah oh okay no well secrets. in that case well you were going to show this anyway <laughs> i was going to show it but it's not a secret it's it's something that it was internally we cool. wanted to um colored carbon fiber like right this. colored but, carbon fiber. but so you're not dying the the carbon the strings. special treatment that this guy's figured out um, and again, <laughs> I'm showing it and saying, hey, this would be great for cars, but he's not a, he's not a car guy. Oh, man. He makes, uh, he makes art. Really? <laughs> really. And he figures it out. Does he understand out. what he has? Huh? 
Does he understand what he has? I'm not sure, but I, I, I will tell you for sure that... Um, Are you going to buy it from him for like $20 and then... <laughs> no. No, I'm trying to get <laughs> somebody else to buy it from him for what it's really and truly worth. Let me take but guess who it is? You don't want this. The Chinese. Not yeah, Exactly right. So here's the thing. The Chinese, Chinese, their trains go, I don't know, 300 miles an hour. Not fast enough. Chairman Xi says, hey, we got to make this go faster. How do you make it go faster? Make it lighter. Exactly. <gasps> a white, have you ever seen their trains? They're all white. By the way, the, what you were saying about- and No internal structure needed. You were saying about consultants and the, you know, not being listened to in the auto industry. That's just generally, a friend of mine's an IT consultant. He's in Texas. He has nothing to do with the auto industry. He works for other industries. And he's made a lot of money. I mean, you know, he, we were out driving his, his uh, career at GT the last time I was down in Dallas. And you know, he, he's got a big house in North Dallas, wealthy man career of consulting, and I said, so what the hell kind of consulting do you do again? Because it's one of these IT things that, you know, layman can just not understand. He said, he goes, oh, suffice to say that I just, I do a lot of IT consulting for a lot of different clients once in a while, and they pay me a lot of money for it. Once in a while, they actually do what I tell them to do. <laughs> I, said, so they, I said, so they pay you a lot of money, and they almost never listen. He goes, I wouldn't say almost never, but, you know, like one in five. Huh. Here's the, here's the difference, okay? So um, an engine company that makes engines for class eight trucks, they came to us and they, uh, and, and they said, Can you, could you redesign our engine? We need to reduce the cost, but we also need to get to Euro six. And I said, well, you know, you're, <laughs> you're at opposite ends of the spectrum. That polluting thing, I've seen them on the street. I mean, I think that's a great way of making carbon. You can't forget carbon dioxide. You just, you just spit out big lumps of the stuff. And, uh, and I said, I don't, I don't know if we can do that. Please try to give it a try. Please. I never hear please from any uh, North American, except please get out of my office maybe. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but we went in and we analyzed this car, or this, uh, this engine. We took 35% of the cost out, and it's Euro 06. Wow. Now, was this an old engine? You bet. I think it was maybe it was from World War II or something. And and but at the end at the end of the day, the thing is lighter. It does everything they wanted it to do, and they take every suggestion. Hmm. I mean, there's a there's a, a newspaper article um, from uh, from I think it's from Shenzhen. Anyway, um, I had one of my people, one of my Chinese guys translated for me, and he said, um, basically, there's this special kind of tea in Shenzhen, and, um, and it, they're very well known for it. And the article title is, this guy's going to become more popular than this special kind of tea. So, um, yeah, uh, but they, they, they take your advice. They take your advice. They, they, they do everything, everything. I, they're hungry for, for knowledge. Our guys, oh, yeah, we heard of that before. Uh, I can spell lean design. You know, I don't need it. Yeah, so it's different. It's just a different, uh, different kind of... Uh, I mean, we do have um, a few American customers, but not many. Like I say, uh, we have a one... I mean, it's not secret. We, we do a lot of work with Chrysler, but that's not an American company, mm -hmm. Chrysler Fiat. Yeah. So is, is this still... Not invented here syndrome? I, maybe. To me, most of the, what I bumped into is just an extreme amount of arrogance. When, when I was, I'm, I worked for Ford, I, I got up in the ranks fairly high. Um, and um, I mean, we were always looking for this, you know, some nutcase that would walk in and, and, uh, and show us how to spin straw into gold. but. Nowadays, nobody gets in to see an engineer with uh, any wacky idea. Like, for instance, uh, I showed you the, the thing here uh, for Uber, right? Well, that guy has been beating on the doors of all the auto companies and got nowhere. And I, I told him, you can't do that. You've got to find something else. Somebody else has got to be able to uh, help you out. So John uh, tried to here and there and whatnot. I helped him as much as I could. And when I found out that Uber um, hired... Um, uh, hired uh, Moore, uh, uh, Dr. Moore from uh, from uh, NASA. I mean, I, I I've known him forever. So uh, um, you know, I said I'll, I'll be out with that. I can do that. 
and then, but he's gotten in with uh, other people, uh, specialty car people. Um, I don't know how much I can really, uh, I don't want to drop too much, but he might be a good eye. A good guy to bring on. That's a great I'll suggestion. You. No, I, I'd love to be in touch yeah. with him. He'd make a great guest for the show. Yeah, well, let me let me see what I can do about making that happen. Then you can get everything straight from the horse's mouth. I, I don't like, like I'm on as a board of advisors and whatnot, but uh, but I'd rather not be the guy that's uh, blowing his corn. He, mm -hmm. should, he should, he can come in and, yep. and, and tell you about it. So, so do you think that, you know, as, as, the car companies are talking about, you know, doing more stuff with Silicon Valley and so on, that they'll be receptive to those guys, but they're just not receptive to outfits like Monroe and Associates because you're here and you're not in Santa Clara County? From familiarity, well, that's number one. Well, if he was really smart, he'd be living in California. <laughs> and that's, I've heard that plenty of times, you know, if you were really smart, you'd be living someplace else. You wouldn't be living here. But at the end of the day, you want a car done? Where did Tesla have their engineering done? It was not in California. Okay, so uh, it was here. It was. This is where this is where things are designed. And well, Toyota has R and D in Ann Arbor. So does Hyundai. Yeah, yeah. Nissan's well, got R and D in Farmington Hills. When Waymo needed those uh, little bug cars built, they went to Roush Industries. Right, and that's it. The the most under appreciated assets we've got are, are right, right here, here in town. You can. Yeah. You can spin around on one foot with your eyes closed and your finger pointing, and when you stop, I can guarantee you you'll be able to point in a straight line to about 100 guys that could help you out. Um, whether that happens or not is irrelevant. A lot of things are different than, you know what else is hugely different? <laughs> I, when I go to China, um, everything is social, everything. We, we will go for dinner tonight. We'll do this, we will do that. Presence all over. Our, our place is loaded with Chinese and Korean and Japanese uh, presence, even European presence. They're everywhere. Every, I, mean, it, come, I mean, you come back to my place and look at the walls. They're everywhere. And I mean, it's spectacular stuff. This isn't just, you know, your rinky dink, um, you know, here's our cup. Uh, that, that, it's not like that. Sandy needs stuff, more graft. Yeah, exactly. This stuff is all handmade. There's a paper cutting on our uh, one wall that uh, uh, knock your eyes out. And somebody with a little pair of scissors, what, are you kidding me? How, how long did this take? And did they go blind when they have to be, you know, they got a white cana? Try that and in, in the United States. It used to be that way. Oh, yeah, but, I remember. But the problem is, you know, there was a lot of abuse, too, especially in purchasing. And, uh, and that's where the big crackdown came. And, you know, you know if, if you're a supplier, you can't even buy a sandwich for an engineer right. at a car company. Yeah, that's exactly well, right. the abuse that's was more in services I mean, than goods. But yeah. Do you think it's, it's a sign of your being appreciated that they're doing that for you? Um, some of the people that I'm talking about that, I mean, really did big stuff, we're never going to do business with them. Never. Never. But it's kind of like respect for each other. We just, somehow we've missed that, uh, that, that opportunity. I mean, <laughs> right now it's all about price. And that's another reason probably we don't Here have or everywhere? Here, here. No, not everywhere. In Europe, they don't care. In, uh, if you've got, if you, if you have a cost and you bring along value and they see results, implemented, implementable results, you're going to get the job. Here, how much is it? Oh, I'll have to shop that around. Okay, so you were talking about why did the social world fall apart in the United States and it was because of purchasing. I could tell you flat, it's exactly the same thing that's causing everything to fall apart again because how are, there's, a, there's an adage that we use all the time. You get what you measure. Be careful what you measure, right? So if you're being measured as how cheap you can buy something, but you have no responsibility at the end as to whether it works or not. Yeah. Sandy's always yelling, cheap, cheap always loses. Cheap always loses. And it's true, too. Every time I bought the cheap or something, I, I, I ended up replacing it like, like a year later. And why do you do it? I mean, because... Yeah, I don't do it anymore. Been, I used to. We, have been, we have been indoctrinated into believing that cheap is good. The, uh, there's an ads on TV, right? A cheap price also. Rex, or sorry, a cheap price is better than an than a expensive price every time. And they got some kid eating 
spinach or broccoli or something, right? And another one, there's a woman there and she's eating, I'm having ice cream here and my husband's eating ice cream and, but his ice cream is less money than my ice cream and that's good. Well, okay, fine. <laughs> what's, the, what's the due date on this thing? Because I've gone into that store and I looked at it. This is a year out of date. I don't think I... I mean, at the end of the day, it all boils down to one thing. You get what you pay for. And so nobody really is looking for that here. I think most of the people around here are just looking for a cheap price. If they can get a cheap price, they're in. It's just like, you know, it's just like buying broccoli or spinach or whatever the heck it is. Uh, doesn't matter to the purchasing agent. If it fails, does it his fault? No. Somebody else's problem. Actually, hmm. I will tell you uh, a terrible story. <clears throat> we, we have certain companies I'm not interested in doing business with. So I'm working with one company that I am interested in and their, their aircraft. And I'm showing them some stuff and Dave, Dave Lewitt comes running up and he said, hey Sandy, uh, we just got a, a whole bunch of executives from this other place and, and, and they, they want to tour and they want to talk to us about benchmarking a car and blah, blah. I said, you're wasting your time. He said, well, I, we, you need to be there. You need to show your face. Why? They're not going to buy anything from us, Dave. Honest, honest. We went through the whole rigmarole. I got sucked in. I started believing it. And not only us, because this was a huge project. So Altair, I hope, I'm not going to go into it, but a bunch of different companies, okay? We're all to get in, and we're all pulling this proposal together. Everybody's working uh, uh, till midnight trying to get this all done. We get it all finished, hand it in to Brand X, and uh, engineers are excited, they're asking questions and all this. Did we get the job? No. The price that these other, it's a two car garage in, um, in um, uh, I don't know, it's, it's some, one of the northern, play, I can't think of the name. A two car garage, literally, I'm not making this up, a two car garage, they came in cheaper then the guy that, that came in, like we had to do uh, analysis on the materials. That was the lowest price in the whole thing. These guys came in for the whole job. This is a whole car. They came in cheaper than the guys for doing the material analysis on the benchmarking. And, and uh, Lewick told me that. And I just sat back in my chair and I said, how in the hell, nobody's gonna be able to, how are you gonna, you can't do it, it's impossible. I mean, cause we, had, we shaved our price down to nothing not what well, we would have sold it somewhere else. We shaved it down to nothing. And still they went to this guy. I mean, it was a failure, a huge failure, a gigantic failure. The engineers suffered and we heard plenty from them. Oh, I wish we could have got you. Can you help us out with this? Can you? No, no, I'm, I'm not, no. I mean, you got your problems, I got mine. I'm not, I'm not here to help you. I'm sorry, you, you picked something else. What about purchasing? Well, those guys didn't get the job done. I did my job. I got it cheap. Well, you did. You got it cheap, but there's no way in hell somebody could do that. That's the kind of mentality that, that throws you under the no, bus I've said every that for time. years. Nothing in purchasing is ever going to change until you change how you reward and promote your buyers. Right. And if you're, you're exactly right. If it's just on price, that's all you're going to get. And the, the VPs at the top talk a big game about, oh, we're going to get all this stuff done. Uh, I will give one of them uh, a, a lot of credit that you're, you know, with the, the planning perspectives shows a big improvement, but uh, for the most part, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Steve Kiefer's really worked on, yeah. uh, on that, and, and they have shown some results. Yeah. Hey, we're going to have to wrap up. Yeah. i got to let Run. the crew go. <laughs> <laughs> what? You mean they don't sleep here? I thought for sure well, they were they, like... They uh, have more production to to oh, wow. Well, thanks very much. That's where the uh, guys make uh, sweaters and stuff like that. So, <laughs> cutting so. <laughs> this is cool.